the purpose is, because that's what the verses say. Now, here's what, I guess it throws people, I, it didn't throw me, but, and there's other people who didn't throw, but it seems to throw people that there's two calendars going simultaneously. Before Exodus, go to Exodus chapter 12, before Exodus, uh, there was a different calendar. And it was this one that we're talking about today. Rosh Hashanah was the first month from the beginning of time. But then in Exodus, God added another calendar. He put another calendar on top of the calendar and twisted it. So that the seventh month is the first month and the first month is the seventh month. Let me show you what I mean. In, in Exodus chapter 12, and in Hebrew it is super clear. Not as clear in English. It says, well, if you know Hebrew, like it. The Lord said to Moshe and Aaron, Look, that moon, that's the first moon. That's what it says in Hebrew. This moon, Chodesh Hazeh, Chodesh Hazeh. Hazeh means this. God is like showing the moon. And he says, this is the new moon to you. Rosh Chodesh. This is the Rosh Chodesh to you. From now on. From now on, it shall be the first month of year two. First month of year two. But it wasn't before. From now on, it's the first month. So what he did was he had a calendar that had the first month Rosh, that Rosh Hashanah begins. And then on top of that, he put another calendar. He put another calendar that has the seventh month in the first month. And the first month in the seventh month. Nisan then becomes the seventh month in that first calendar. And in the second calendar, Nisan's the first month. So that the first becomes the seventh, and the seventh becomes the first. There's two calendars going on simultaneously. The rabbis did not make up Rosh Hashanah. That is not true. It's not rabbinical. It's biblical. Not only is it biblical, but there are more, and this is, I'm sure this is going to be frustrating, there's more scriptures about Rosh Hashanah in the Bible, or should I say, scriptures that their doctrines pertain to Rosh Hashanah than any other festival in the Bible. So if you don't understand that there's two calendars, you miss all the clues. Now we just read through this entire service, and I gave you all the clues. We read all the clues that the Jewish people read every single year at Rosh Hashanah. You've got all the clues. Now if you know what the scriptures are, that it's like a basket of Rosh Hashanah, you can put all those scriptures in the Rosh Hashanah basket. And what I have found is that there's more scriptures in the Rosh Hashanah basket than any other festival. More than Passover. More than Shavuot. More than Sukkot. More than any other festival. But if you don't know what Rosh Hashanah is, you miss it. You miss the clues. So, this moon, he points to it basically, this moon shall be to you Rosh Chodesh. And then he says, it shall be the first month of the year to you. But it wasn't before. Go to Genesis chapter 6. When you're reading before Exodus 12, and God gave us the, quote, religious calendar, because that's, that's what they call it. They call it the religious calendar. The one that we're talking about tonight, Rosh Hashanah, is the beginning of the civil calendar. But when you're talking about the religious calendar that God added in Exodus chapter 12, if you're before Exodus 12, don't read it from the, the Exodus 12 calendar. Don't read it from the religious calendar. Read it from the civil calendar. In chapter, uh, sorry, chapter 7, when he brings the flood, he gives all the dates. And if you read it on the wrong calendar, you don't get the right pictures. But if you read it on the original calendar, when Rosh Hashanah was the head of the year and God created everything on Rosh Hashanah, then it begins to make sense. Look at verse 11. The 600th year of Noah's life in the second month. Now, on, on the civil calendar, the one after Exodus 12, 
That's ER, month ER. But on the original calendar, what's the second month? Heshvan. Good, Heshvan. Heshvan on the 17th day of the month. And then it starts giving all the genealogy, so to speak, of the flood. And if you count from Heshvan 17, you, all these pictures start to flow, start to form. Look at uh, chapter 8, verse 4. In the seventh month, on the 17th of the month, the seventh month, what month would that be on the old calendar? What? No, that's on the new calendar. It's on the new calendar. On the old calendar, remember the seventh became the first and the first became the seventh. On the seventh month, in the 17th the month, what month would that be? That's Nisan. That's Avi. That's Nisan. Nisan 17 is the day Yeshua rose from the dead. It's Bikorim, first fruits. And then the, the same exact thing happens here. They come up from death on the 17th of Avi. Same exact picture. And by the way, there's a bunch of pictures in, in the flood, not just one. A whole bunch of them. Did Noah rest? Uh, yeah, I was about to do that. Verse 13. It came about in the 600, 601st year, in the first month, on the first of the month. What day is that? What day is that? What month is that? Tishri. This month. What day is the first day? Rosh Hashanah. Rosh Hashanah. This is Rosh Hashanah. The water was dried up. The, co the covering was removed. He looked. The ground is dry. And he's saved. On Rosh Hashanah. It's a new beginning. Water's gone. Flood's gone. It's been how, how many years? What year did it say it was? What year? 600. Come on, guys. What year did it say it was? 600. 600 in first year. This is a picture of the 6,000th year. 6,001. When the kingdom comes. And there's a whole new beginning. And it, the earth returns to the Edenic state. Alrighty. So the question is, why is there a new calendar in Exodus? Why did God add it? Because there's two comings of the Messiah. It has to be two calendars. So Yeshua can come to fulfill the spring festivals, and Yeshua can come to fulfill the, the uh, fall festivals. But they're both in the first. They're both in the first month. He fulfills both calendars in the first month, both times. Only they're seven months apart. Look at Hoshea chapter 6. Let us know. Uh, I, actually, I like that. Let us know. Let us strive. Let us struggle <clears throat> to know the Lord. He comes to us as the rain. As flood rain watering the earth. I hate this translation that I gave you. Please forgive me for the translation. It's awful. But I, I just couldn't figure out how to get this to make sense in English. This is as close as I can get. The word... Geshem is a word for rain. The word Malkosh is a word for rain. The word Yore is a word for rain. They're all words for rain. Yore is like a pouring out. So it could be like, like flooding or raining or pouring out or something like that. Geshem is a specific rain. Malkosh is a specific rain. Now here's the tricky thing. Geshem falls from Nisan for the next three months. From Nisan for the next three months. Malkosh, guess when that flows? Guess when that falls? No, starting two months before Tishri and ending at Sukkot, into Tishri. So this one, Geshem, is, you could call it a spring rain. Malkosh, you could call it a fall rain. But I couldn't get all that in the English translation. So that's what I wanted to say. He comes to us as rain, as a 
fall a spring rain to us like the fall rain poured out on the land. Did you get that? Two rains. One in spring, one in fall. Yes? yes. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. If that makes sense, then Joel should make sense. Joel says, for he gives you the rain to righteousness. It says, let's that. And there's a lot of different translations that are not, not very clear. But in Hebrew, it says to righteousness. He gives you the rain to righteousness. 2.23. He has given you the rain to righteousness, and he has poured down for you the rain, the early and latter rain. There is no such thing as early and latter rain. That is a mistranslation. But again, not as good as we can do because it's Malkosh and sorry, More Geshem, More Malkosh. There's those three words again. They all mean rain. Geshem, when is Geshem? I just told you when Geshem is. When is it? Come on. Spring. Is it spring? Geshem is in spring. Moreh. Malkosh. When is Malkosh? Fall. Fall. Lorishon. Lorishon. In the first. Right. First what? Exactly. That's the question you're supposed to ask. First what? First month. First month. All the rabbis say it. All the rabbis say it. Why? Because there's there's two calendars. Laid one on top of the other and twisted. First becomes seventh, seventh becomes first. The Geshem falls in the first month in Nisan. The Malkosh falls in the first month in Tishri. Seven months apart. So there's two comings of Nisan. Two first months. Two calendars. That's why it's important you understand Rosh Hashanah. You cannot understand the calendar. You can't. You can't understand the calendar unless you understand that there's two calendars and Rosh Hashanah is the beginning of the second. Sorry, the first challenge, not the second one. It was from creation. This is why the rabbis say, and whenever I say that phrase, I know your eyes just gloss over. This is why the rabbis say Rosh Hashanah was the beginning of creation. Because it's the first day, the first month, on the original calendar. That's as easy as I can make it. It's as simple as I can make it. The rest is going to have to be up to you. So, why is it important that Rosh Hashanah is the birthday of the world? Because that's what we call it. It's, it's birthday of the world. It's the beginning of creation. Psalm 90 verse 4 says, For a thousand years in your sight are like yesterday when it is past by. How long is yesterday when it is past by? How long is yesterday when it's passed by? Guys, if you don't think this is hard for me, you're wrong. To have this music behind me is really hard for me to concentrate. So I need your help. So please, if I ask you a question, I, I gotta hear you so I know what's going on. How long is yesterday when it passes by? It's exactly 24 hours. Am I? Is, is this reading me? Is it something? Yeah. Okay. It's exactly 24 hours. So yesterday, when it passes by, is precisely 24 hours. And that's like how long? A day. A day. No, no. It is a day. How? What is it like? No, it is 24 hours. What is it like? A it's like a thousand years. A thousand years is like exactly one day. What is a day like? Okay, now, it's not to us, it's to God. To God, a day is a thousand years. A thousand years. Or, as a watch in the night. I'm not going to get into that. First Peter 3, 8, and you can see. 
see this. This is written by a Jew to Jews in a Jewish context, quoting Jewish scripture. It's uh, Second Peter. What did I? Oh, I put First Peter. Thank you. It's Second Peter three. Three. And. Uh, comes to exactly the same conclusion. Listen to me carefully. You're going you're gonna to love this. He comes to exactly the same conclusion that all the rabbis do. All the rabbis came to this conclusion. Hey, if there's a thousand years and that's a day, that means we got six days of a thousand years each and God's day, his Shabbat, is the last day. Seventh day. That's what the rabbi said. Summed up by Rabbi Katina. But it was said by all the rabbis. And Rabbi Katina summed it up, and it was said. He said, God has a day that is Yom Shekulo Shabbat, the day that is all of it Sabbath, and it is a thousand years long. Peter comes to the same conclusion, because look what he says. Verse 8, do not let this one fact escape your notice, beloved. And with the Lord, one day is a thousand years. A thousand years is one day. What's he quoting? What's he quoting? Psalm. Psalm Nine. what? Nine verse, Nine. Nine verse four. Now, the rabbis quoted it and came to the conclusion that it's about the day of the Lord. Verse nine. The Lord is not. The Lord is not slow about his promises. Some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing for any to perish. But for everybody to come to Teshuvah. But the day of the Lord, the day of the, the day of the Lord, the day of the Lord, the day of the Lord, not the Lord, the day of the Lord, the day of the Lord will come like a thief, in which the heavens will pass away with a roar, and the elements will be rebuilt, destroyed with intense heat, and the earth and its works will be burned up. He comes to the same conclusion the rabbis do. That God has a day called the day of the Lord. And it's his Shabbat. Now this makes it sound horrible. Horrible, horrible. Are you burning up? Indeed, that is not helping me. These are its main titles. In two days. The day of the Lord. The Shabbat. And the kingdom. Yeshua went everywhere preaching the gospel of what? The kingdom. This is what he was talking about. That's all he talked about. That's all he talked about. He talked as if he was already there. If, if, as a matter of fact, he talked as if we were already there. He taught, he taught like as if you're living there already and how to live there already. But if you don't even know what it is, how can you live there already? That's like me telling you, hey guys, uh, you know, you know all the rules of my house. Why don't you live like you're in my house? You don't know my house. You don't know the rules of my house. If we don't know the kingdom, if you don't know what's going to happen in the kingdom, and you don't know when it's going to happen, and you don't know the details of what's going to happen, you don't know the kingdom. And so you hear the words of Yeshua, and he's preaching the kingdom, the kingdom, the kingdom is like this, and the kingdom is like that. And you're like, yes, it's so amazing. What does that mean? Because it's a foreign language. So we got to learn the language of the Shabbat, the kingdom, the thousand-year kingdom. And it's a long learning curve. It takes a long time to learn the lingo of that day. If I was to say to you, What's going to happen in the fourth year of the birth pains on the Sukkot? Do you know? Of course you know. I just learned three years ago. I have been living for 38 years. So it's, it's a long learning curve to learn this day. And then when you read the words of Yeshua, and he's talking about the gospel of this day, it's like, yeah, I recognize, I remember that. I saw that. I saw it, I was there, I saw it, I remember, it's amazing. That's how it works. Alright, so each 
takes a thousand years. What's the last year in day three? I just pointed to it. What's the last day in day three? Last year in day three. What's the last year in day three? I just pointed to it. What? Three thousand. What's the last year in the fourth day? That's the year Yeshua died. Yeshua died the very last year of day four. And then there's two days, and then in the third, he raises us up. Raises us up. That's what it says in Hoshia. Let us come to know the Lord. After two days, he will revive us. And on the third, he will raise us up. After two days, he will revive us. And on the third, he will raise us up. That's the resurrection. Yeah, baby. So, what year does the day of the Lord come? Everybody, what year is the day of the Lord come? Six thousand. What? Six thousand. End of 6,000, beginning of 6,001. We like to say 6,000 because it's neat. It's tidy. And that's fine. Here's 6,000. That's when the day of the Lord comes. You now know when the day of the Lord has come. You now, now, you now know when the day of the Lord has come. I'm not going to go into the myth of no man knows the day or the hour because that is a myth. It's mythology. It's not biblical at all. Not in any way, shape, or form. But I can't, there's just no time to cover it right now. But you can see six days and then the Shema. And each day's a thousand years. So the day before it comes in the year 6,000. You can see that. Now, Rosh Hashanah has five themes. Uh, get, your, get your hand out. You still have your hand out? Get your hand out in front of you. Look back at the cover, at the titles. Look back at the cover. These are the titles of, of Rosh Hashanah. Head of the year, you now know why it's that. Yom Teruah, the day of the awakening blessed. Look up here. That's the first theme. The blowing of the shofar. Specifically, specifically for the resurrection. The blowing of the shofar for specifically for the resurrection. Which of the three sounds that, that Daniel blew was the one that wakes us up? Was it tekiah, teruah, or shabarim? Tekiah, teruah, or shabarim? Come on. Tekiah. No, not tekiah. Teruah. teruah. This day is called Yom Teruah. Day of the awakening or the wake up call. Day of the awakening blast. Well, it wakes people up that are asleep. Those are the, the dead. It wakes them up for the resurrection. It's called the king, Hamelech. That's the second theme of Rosh Hashanah. Every year we read all those, what was it, Machuyot? Machuyot verses about the king, the kingdom. In that day he shall be one, his name shall be one, he is the king. So we talk about the king, and the king. And then there's Yom Hazikaron, Day of Remembrance. Now, this one is tough to understand. I'm going to skip down to number four. Sealing for redemption, judging from the books. This is difficult to understand because the lingo is so weird. This is about the giving of gifts by God to his bride and dividing everybody into the good, the bad, and the ugly. The good, the evil, and the intermediate, like the ones that are in between. That's what sealing for redemption is. Yom Hazikaron is that. Remembrance. Remembering his bride. So that takes us up to number three, too. The heavenly, the heavenly marriage between Israel and his bride. The day of remembrance. Just Yom Hazikaron. And then the last one. Yom HaKisei, Day of Concealment. If you've never been to a Jewish wedding, you don't know what this means. Because in a Jewish wedding, Jews always get married under a chuppah, a canopy, 
that has doors. Like they usually have cedar, but there are doors that are closed. That's because it's like a remnant, a remembrance of ancient. In ancient days, it wasn't a chupa; it was a room. <coughs> and the couple would go off to this room for seven days while everybody partied. While they're in the wedding chamber and the doors are shut, everybody else is partying. And then they come out at the end of the seven days and party with them. That's the wedding feast. The wedding feast is not the seven days of the It's called the seven days of the Chopa. Sheva Yamin Chopot. The seven days of the Chopa. That is the heavenly marriage. Every Jewish wedding that has ever been is a picture of the heavenly marriage between God and Israel. Yeah. And in Rosh Hashanah, we read all these verses about that. All right, I'm going to clear up some lingo. Once or twice? 
23 times. Same amount of passages as there are about birth pangs. Isn't that weird? 23 times it calls us being taken up on Rosh Hashanah the resurrection. It's called Hachaya. The resurrection, the life. 23 chromosomes. Oh, there's 23 chromosomes. Very good. Oh, that's cool. Ain't that cool? That's beautiful. 23 chromos sets of chromosomes. 23 sets of chromosomes in the human body. In life. In life. Right? In life. Right? And how do you say the resurrection in Hebrew? Hachaya. The life. The life thing. Really is what it is. The life thing. So it's resurrection. It's not rapture. We're not waiting for a rapture. We're waiting for the resurrection. This is all just lingo. You can call it whatever you want. But this is lingo from Judaism. This is what the Bible calls it. The king and the kingdom. What's its other titles? Kingdom and what else? What else? Day of the Lord. Day of the Lord. What else? Rest. Day of rest. What else? Shabbat. The Shabbat. Seven and the day. What's the big one? The day of the Lord. Day of the Lord. Sorry. Day of the Lord. Okay. Now, this thing here is a breakout. It's like a little tiny, like, like a microscope, looking at the first seven years of the Day of the Lord. Here's the Day of the Lord. How long does it last? Six thousand years. No, no, no. Just the Day of the Lord. Just the Day of the Lord. How long? A thousand years. The first seven years. This is first tiny little sliver is when all the themes of Rosh Hashanah occur. They start on Rosh Hashanah because creation was on Rosh Hashanah. Creation plus 6,000 years brings us to the day of the Lord at Rosh Hashanah. And bam! Everything starts. And the pattern that God gave us as Jews is a seven-day wedding. We didn't make this up. It's not something Jews made up. It's not rabbinical. It's biblical. Jacob married at a seven-day marriage. Samson had a seven-day marriage. A couple others in the Bible. Look them up. Do your research. So you got a seven-year span of marriage. And simultaneously, you have the seven-year birth pains. Or what the church calls the tribulation. But the Bible calls birth pains. So we gotta, we gotta fix the way we talk. We gotta fix our lingo in order to talk kingdom talk. You gotta know what you're, it paints the right picture to say the right words. So resurrection, not rapture. Try it. Try it when you're talking with somebody. I mean, like when they're having a conversation, try to say resurrection instead of rapture. You know, start painting a different picture in your head. Say kingdom. Don't say millennium. Say kingdom or day of the Lord. It'll start painting a different picture in your head. And <laughs> here, John, I'll tell you about that. In the football, it's not the wedding feast. Right? Some of you might think that it's the wedding feast. It is not the wedding feast. The wedding feast is a dip, at a different festival. Remember, the Jewish wedding was seven days while they're in the chuppah, in the room, and they come out of the room for the wedding feast. And then, this is the big one. Try it. When you're talking to people, say birth pains instead of tribulation. And they'll say, well, what's birth pain? What is that? And you can explain. You can even paint a picture for you in your head. You read the Bible. Oh, there's people in birth pain. And it'll start making sense to them. I, I feel like I am walking uphill through jello, pushing a big rock. This is so difficult. I am. Well, that's well. That's Well, thank you. I wish that made it easier. It's, it's just hard. It's just hard. All right. So Isaiah 13. You got to see that one. Now there, there's lots of verses. 23 verses about the birthday. But I just picked one. 
because you already ate dinner and you're getting sleepy. Wail, wail, for the day of the Lord is not the Lord. The day of the Lord. How long is the day of the Lord? How long? A thousand years. The day of the Lord is here. It will come as destruction from the Almighty. Therefore, all hands will fall limp. Every man's heart will melt. They will be terrified. Pains and anguish will take hold of them. Who? Take hold of who? Every whose heart will melt? What does it say? Come on, guys. What does it say? Every man's heart will melt. And they will go into birth pains. Not women. Men. And this is specifically written like this so you can understand it's not talking about something physical. It's telling us a metaphor. Birth pains is a title because it's awful. You women know that. We don't know that as men. But every man will go into birth pains. Every man's heart will go. And it says that in Hebrew. They will be terrified. Pains and angels will take them. They will arrive like a woman in labor. They will look at one another with astonishment. Their faces are on fire. Behold, the day of the Lord is coming cruel. You fear that doesn't sound good. That's the kingdom. That's the kingdom. It's the first seven years of the kingdom. The kingdom starts bad. Do you know how the temple, how the uh, how the Shabbat started in, in temple times? Do you know what the very first thing that was done? It's called the swilling, the swilling of the courts. And they, there was like a big conduit, water conduit. They block it up. It was at one end of the temple courts. And they block it up. And water would rush over the entire courts and, and uh, uh, wash away the blood and the suet and the poop and the sinews and the skin and the bits of flesh that got uh, uh, dropped in the sacrifices. That's the very first thing that happened. All the garbage was washed away. That's how the Shabbat begins. Isn't that amazing? It's Teshuvah. That's how every Shabbat should start. With Teshuvah. But that's how the day of the Lord is going to start. And it's worldwide. And it's seven years long to swill away all those 6,000 years of garbage. And after that will come the new part. Now, Shaul said the same exact thing. He wrote the same exact thing. We don't want you to be uninformed about those who are asleep. If you're asleep, what do you have to do? Wake up. If you're asleep, what do you have to do? Wake up. How do we wake up? Which sound is it that wakes us up? Teruah. Teruah. And Rosh Hashanah is the day of the awakening blast. The day of the resurrection. We're going to wake up on Rosh Hashanah. After 6,000 years of human history, we're going to wake up if we're dead. If we're dead. And if we're, that's right, it's a resurrection. And if we're alive, we're going to go immediately afterwards. That's what it says. We don't want you to be foolish about those who are asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with the teruah, with the voice of the angel, and with the shofar of God. And the dead in Messiah will rise first. The dead, the dead will wake up and rise. Now as, as to the times, you have no need of anything to be written to you. Look at me. If I say to you, I don't need to write you a single thing, why would that be? Why would that be? Because you already know. You already know. You already know. You're supposed to know. And he says that. For you yourselves know full well. You yourselves know full well that the day of the Lord, not the Lord, not the Lord, the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night while they are saying, Shalom and safety and destruction will come upon them. 
suddenly like birth pains. Oh, like birth pains upon a woman with child, and they will not escape. But you, but you, totally different. You brothers are not in darkness that the day should overtake you like a thief. Those who are believers go in the resurrection. So next time you're talking to a believer and they say, do you believe in pre true rapture? You're going to have to clean up the lingo so you can speak a common language. Try this. Try it. You mean, do I believe that the resurrection is going to occur before the birth pains? Yeah. And they'll say, what's birth pains? And then you can teach. But if you're not speaking a common language, you're talking past each other. And by the way, we don't have to speak the wrong language anymore. We don't have to speak the wrong language. We can use the right words. Jews have been doing it for 4,000 years. Let's do the right, let's say the right words. Because this is what they've been teaching, and they've kept it for us. And obviously, I didn't do the whole verse. The whole verse has even more good stuff in it. Isaiah 26. Oh, this is this is this is this is my jam right here. Isaiah 26. This is awesome. I love this verse. These verses. Why? Because look at all it has. It has the resurrection. It has the birth pains, and it has the wedding in it. All at the same time. That's why the Jews teach it at the same time. The resurrection, the wedding, the birth pains, all at the same time. Chapter 26, verse seven, uh, 16. O oh Lord, they sought you in distress. They could only whisper a prayer. Your chastening was upon them. As the now it's going to describe it. As the pregnant woman approaches the time to give birth, she writhes and cries out in her labor pains. That's how we were before you. Past tense. Did you catch that? Past tense. Why? Why past tense? We're already gone. Yeah, basically, we're already gone. Here's why. All the prophecies are written in past tense. Because they were there. They were there. Revelation 1.10 says, I was in the Spirit unto the day of the Lord. And he wrote the entire book of Revelation about the birth pangs. Because he was there. And all the prophets were taken in the day of the Lord. They were there. And we're going to be there. And so it's past tense. Thus we were before you. We remember it. As a pregnant woman approaches the time to give birth, she rides and cries out in her labor pain. That's how we were before you, Lord. We were pregnant. We ride. We gave birth as a word of nothing. When we could not accomplish deliverance for the earth and inhabitants of the world were not born, your dead will live. So this house, just like that. Your dead will live. Your corpses will rise. You who lie in the dust, wake up and shout for joy because your dew is as the dew of the dawn and the earth will give birth to the departed spirits. Come, my, now look at this. There's the resurrection. And now, come, my people, enter into your chederot. What's a header? I told you earlier. Thank you. Wedding chamber. Wedding chambers a chedr. Like when you go to, you know, when, when, a, when a Jewish kid goes to yeshiva when he's a kid, they call, did you go to cheder when you were a kid? Did you go to cheder? That's the same word. It's a wedding chamber. Where we go learn the Torah is the wedding chamber. Close your doors behind you. Hide for a little while. How long? How long? How long? Come on, guys, stay with me. How long? How long do the birth pains last? Seven years. How long does the marriage last? 
seven days, seven, seven days or seven years. So it says hide for a little while until, until the indignation runs its course. Indignation in Hebrew is the frothing of the mouth. This is the highest level of anger that's in the Bible. Hide for a little while. Come into your wedding chamber and hide for a little while until the indignation runs its course. Come into the wedding chamber until the birth pains are done. And then you come out and you have a wedding feast. Enter to your room and close the door behind you. Hide for a little while until the indignation runs its course. For behold, the Lord is about to come out from his place to visit, and this is visit in a bad way, visit the inhabitants of the world. How long is God going to visit the world? Ten days, ten years. How long? Ten years. Come on, guys, wake up. How long? Ten years. Seven years. Seven years. And the earth will reveal her bloodshed and will no longer cover her slain. For Thessalonians, again, comes up with the same exact thing. I don't want you to get informed about those who are asleep. For the Lord Himself will descend from heaven with the Teruah, with the voice of the angel, with the shofar of God, and the dead Messiah will rise first. Now as to the times, you have no need of anything to be great to you, for you yourselves know full well that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night, while they are saved, peace and safety. Destruction will come upon them, suddenly like birth pangs upon a woman with child, and they will not escape. But you... Brothers are not in darkness, that the day should overtake you like a thief. That what should overtake you like a thief? That what should overtake you like a thief? Not the Lord. The day, the day of the Lord. We're not waiting for the day. We're not waiting for the Lord. We're not waiting for the return of the Lord. We're waiting for the day. We're waiting for the coming of the day of the Lord. Because at the coming of the day of the Lord, all the things take place. So we're late waiting for the day of the Lord, not the return of the Lord. The birth pains are not happening now. I don't care what you read on the internet, because there's hundreds and thousands of things on the internet that say the birth pains have become. The birth pains are here. Look around the world. There's earthquakes and famines and da 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 da. It's the birth pain. When do the birth pains take place? In the day of the Lord. We're not in the day of the Lord. We're not happening now. Not until the day of the Lord. We await the coming of the day of the Lord, not the coming of the Lord. We do not go to heaven when we die. Sorry. I have to talk about this because if, if the story that is laid out for us of Rosh Hashanah is true, then we go to sleep when we die. And we have to be woken up by the Teruah. That's what the Teruah is for. If we go to sleep when we die, then that means we're not with the Lord. It means we're asleep. And that's what the Bible says, but people just read it and they don't read it. But it says it. 1 Corinthians 15. Flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. What's the other name for the kingdom of God? What's the other name for the kingdom of God? A day. Come on. Seven. Seven. What else? The day of the rest. The day of rest. What else? The day of the Lord. What else? The, the kingdom. The kingdom. The day of the Lord. The day of rest. Flesh and blood cannot inherit the day of the Lord. The perishable cannot inherit the imperishable. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep. We will not all sleep. That means death. But we will all be changed. For the shofar will sound and the dead will be raised. 1 Thessalonians 4, again, he says, I don't want you to be foolish about those who fall asleep. God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep in Yeshua. Those who have fallen asleep. He says over and over again, sleep away, sleep away, sleep away. And then people go, we're going to be with Jesus when we, and when we die. Sleep away. Sleep away. Sleep away. That's the story. And here's what everybody misquotes. And I've heard this 
for 38 years. Body president. I, I hear it every week on the radio. Somebody asks a Bible answer man or somebody on the radio. They say, um, where do we go when we die? And immediately, they say as if it's a corollary in math. Absent from the bodies to be present with the lower. Like that, I mean, just immediate. They don't think, there's no critical thinking. They just say it. The Bible doesn't say it. It doesn't say it. It doesn't say it. If we, this is what it says. If we know if the earthly tent, our body, is ripped down, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. In this house we grow. He's speaking Rosh Hashanah words. In this house we grow, longing to be clothed with our dwelling from heaven. We don't want to be unclothed, we want to be clothed, so that what is mortal will be swallowed up by life. God gave to us the Spirit as a pledge, as a down payment. Which one of the themes is that? You forgot already? Uh -oh. Which one of the themes is it? He gave us a spirit as a down payment, as a pledge. The one that nobody knows about. Sealing for redemption. That's what it is. It's like a seal put in wax. And it's like you can't open it until the redemption comes. A down payment is what it says in Corinthians. A down payment, a seal. Gave us the spirit as a down payment, as a seal. Therefore, knowing that while we are at home in this body, we are absent from the Lord. That's obvious. While we're at home in this body, we're absent from the Lord. We are of good courage. I say, and prefer. That's all it says. There's no corollary. He says, I wish, I prefer to be absent from the body and to be at home with the Lord. He doesn't say absent the body is present with the Lord. He says, I really prefer to be as absent from this body and in the resurrection present with the Lord. That's what I wish. But it ain't here. So we wait. That's why I made the word prefer big, so you couldn't miss it this time, hopefully. Prefer rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. That's what he said. Now, if they quoted it like that, that'd be cool. Where, where do we go when we die? Well, you know, I would prefer to be with the Lord absent from his body, but we're not. All you got to say be at home with the Lord. Therefore, our aim is, whether at home or absent, to be pleasing to Him. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Messiah. Which theme of Rosh Hashanah is that? Which theme of Rosh Hashanah is that, guys? Get there before I get there. Come on. Right. Sealing for redemption. Very good. So this is two clues in the same passage that he's talking about Rosh Hashanah. And what happens at Rosh Hashanah? The dead are raised. So that's why he's talking about that. So he's talking about resurrection and seeing through them. Now do you understand what I'm saying when I say there's baskets. And if you can figure out which verse, which basket to put a verse in by the clues, all of a sudden those verses come alive. And they make sense. They paint the right, proper, appropriate picture for us. If we don't know where to put it, whether it's Rosh Hashanah, Sukkot, Pesach, Shavuot, we don't know what it means. And we're shooting blind. And we end up saying stuff like, absent from the body, present with the Lord. As if it's a corollary, but it's not. And we end up saying, do you believe in pre-trib right? Stop like that. I've been asking just like the pre So we gotta we gotta get our we gotta get our language to match the Bible. So we're all talking the same language. And if the believers will begin speaking the same language that's in the Bible, right. when they say Bible things, they yeah. might be more accurate. When we get our language to match this book, and the Jews 
My people have kept those words. We've kept that lingo alive for you for 4,000 years. That's our job as Jews. That's our job to keep the lingo and the culture and the life and the meaning and the festivals and all the treasures that are wrapped up in these words alive for you. That's why there's a Jewish people. So, the next time somebody says, oh, Rosh Hashanah is made up by the Jews, made up by the rabbis. Hopefully all this stuff will, and you might not remember a lot of it, but you'll remember, boy, he spoke for a long time. There was a lot of words. <laughs> that was about Rosh Hashanah. That was big. That was a big thing. So maybe you're not right. Maybe that's not right. Maybe there's more to it than rabbis came up with. Let's pray. Thank you, Abba, for this most amazing day that you created like, from your own heart. And I, you hit it, so it's hard. It's been hard for people to find. But then again, you hide all of your secrets, and we have to dig for them. And I thank you, Father, for revealing your secrets to your people. I thank you for revealing your secrets about Yeshua and about the coming of the Messiah, the coming of the day of the Lord, the coming of the resurrection, the coming of you as king, the coming of the heavenly wedding when we go before you as your bride. I thank you for all of the secrets that you've revealed to us, Abba, and ask that you let that snowball and just gain momentum in the name of Yeshua. That's kind of weird. Um, All right, I'm going to turn this back on. Uh,